Hey, hey everyone, hey, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Gordon Brown. I'm a software engineer at Codeplay Software. Hey, I'm here with our VP of R&D, Michael Wong, and um, we're going to talk about uh, heterogeneous programming in C++. So first of all, the uh, acknowledgement disclaimer. A lot of the, the content from these slides has been contributed by other members of Codeplay as well as the standards groups like the C++ group and, and Kronos. Obviously, any, any mistakes there, they're obviously mine. And uh, obviously, le legal disclaimer that um, these, are, these are the views of myself, not necessarily of, of Codeplay in general. So, so who, who, are, who are we? Who, who are Codeplay? So, Codeplay are primarily involved in developing solutions for heterogeneous systems. We're, we're involved in, in many different standards bodies, including Kronos, HSA, and, and C++. We're, we're also recently we've also been involved in uh, standards for safety critical applications, such as the ISO 26262 and ADAS. We also have uh, sort of a suite of uh, for for developing uh, heterogeneous solutions called Compute Suite. So this has uh, Compute Aorta, which is our sort of core technology, which targets uh, a wide range of, of different heterogeneous systems and can support uh, many different standards. And we have Compute CPP, which is our implementation of the, the SICL standard, which I'm going to talk a bit about later on in the talk. So, so, what, so first of all, why am I here to talking to you today? So as of the, the C++ standards meeting, in uh, Jacksonville, February this year, we, we now have a, a mandate to bring heterogeneous computing to C++. So what is heterogeneous computing? So heterogeneous computing involves gaining performance through the utilization of systems which make use of more than one kind of processor, each with specialized processing capabilities to handle particular tasks. <coughs> so it's all about gaining parallelism over putting tasks on hardware that's, that's designed specifically for it. So why should you be interested? So Heterogeneous computing is 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 everywhere now. It's, it's it's driving the technology of the future. It's it's been used for a lot of things such as image processing and machine learning. You can see it in self-driving cars, in, in drones, in speech recognition, animation, medical imaging, and telecommunications, and, and many others. So what I'd like you to to take away from today's talk is uh, a sort of a vision of of what the future of heterogeneous computing in C plus plus is going to look like. So an overview of, of, of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off with a sort of a brief history, sort of where we are and how, and how we got here. And then I'm going to sort of talk about C++ as a, a programming language for heterogeneous computing. And then going to sort of look at some of the, the, the major challenges we face in heterogeneous computing and some of the solutions for them. And then I'm going to look at SICL, so a new standard for uh, programming heterogeneous, um, heterogeneous programming in C++ and some of the the approaches that takes, and then I'm going to um, sort of Michael's going to close off with a, a talk of the looking at the future of heterogeneous programming in C++ and where the standards going. So, to start off with, how how we got here. So, back in 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 our 1989, we were at this this point called sort of you could sort of you can refer to as the, the single core era. So this was a point where we were, we were gaining steady performance gains in, in CPUs based on, on Moore's law. This principle that if, so if every year the, the CPUs would have more and more transistors, which would give us steady performance gains. This is often been referred to as the, the free lunch. The, the earliest sign of heterogeneous computing was, was back in 2001, where the, the introduction of the first sort of user programmable shaders allowing you to do general purpose compute on, on GPUs. In, or in 2005, the, the, sort of the, the free lunch was over. The, sort of the, the this performance gain so, uh, the, from, from Moore's Law stopped. We sort of hit a wall where CPU, perform, CPU performance stopped, uh, CPUs stopped getting faster and this performance gain stopped. So we had to look to new ways to gain performance. Shortly after this, uh, Intel announced their, their first range of dual core CPUs. So CPUs that would, would gain performance through having multiple cores on, on the same chip that would run in parallel. And ar around, around 2007, it's, it's quite hard to have, a, have an ex exact time for this, but there's, there's a point where 
it became evident that the performance gains from adding adding multiple cores to a CPU, adding more cores, wasn't giving us the same performance gains as we did with Moore's Law. And although there are some applications that take that uh, take advantage of of having more cores, and there's there's architectures that have a, a, a large number of cores, the generally the uh, four cores was the optimum amount, and beyond that, we were starting to see sort of diminishing returns. Shortly after this, uh, CUDA was released. So initially, as a, a, a C, C API for offloading code to NVIDIA GPUs. And then 2008, we had OpenCL, which was very, very similar. But it was open to uh, CPUs and GPUs, and it was, wasn't restricted to just NVIDIA. This was an open standard. And then in 2009, DirectX 11 was released with Direct Compute. So this was shaders that could do general purpose computations. And this, is, this is generally used for, for gaming. In 2011, AMD announced the first range of their APUs. So these were devices where rather than having a CPU and a discrete GPU, you would have a, a CPU and a GPU on the same board with shared memory. So this changed the way that you'd have to program them. Later in 2011, uh, OpenACC was released. So OpenACC was br originally branched off from OpenMP in order to support offloading to accelerators. So at the time, OpenMP only supported uh, multi-core CPU parallelism. And then in, in 2010, uh, Altera announced OpenCL support for their FPGAs. In 2013, OpenMP also announced the support for offloading to accelerators. 2015, Texas Instruments announced support of OpenCL support for their DSPs. And then in 2016, recently, H the HSA standard was ratified. So HSA standard is, is, is quite similar to OpenCL. Or it's, it's a lot more lower level. It's more focused on defining the, the requirements for heterogeneous devices. So, so if, the question. So, what what is the most popular language for for heterogeneous computing? And uh, so, I, I, I tried to answer this question. Um, so, to do this, sort of, my, uh, myself and some some colleagues came up with a list of heterogeneous programming languages and models. And uh, so, the sort of the criteria for this would be any any language or model is like a language in itself is not a, a wrapper over another language, and it would have to support more um, heterogeneous devices, not just multi-core CPUs. So we took these and we took the, the, release, the, the dates that these were released and we mapped them out over sort of year by year how many languages were available. And we came up with, we came up with this graph. And this, is, this isn't a definitive representation. It's, it's more of a, a cross sample of the languages and models that, that, we, that we could think of. So there's, I'm sure there's, there's some that aren't in here, but this is sort of a representation of, of the, the trend of um, programming models and languages for heterogeneous computing. And the thing we see here is that from around 2003 onwards, there's been a steady gain in, in programming languages for heterogeneous computing, particularly in, in C and C++. This is, this is another slide with, you, with the same data. The thing we see here is that even as far back as 1999, the C and C++ were the, the dominant languages for heterogeneous computing. So for a long time, C was the, the most dominant language. However, in recent years, C++ has rapidly overtaken it. The other thing to notice is that in the last few years, while C++ has been so rap sort of overtaking the other languages, the other languages have become sort of plateaued and they've, they've not been increasing as much. So the next thing I'd like to do is, is look at some of the, the, sort of the major challenges we face in heterogeneous computing. And so, these are the, the sort of the four four major challenges I want to focus on. There are, there are other other things that are important for heterogeneous computing, but these are the ones that I want to focus on. Uh, so first of all, performance portability. So when we think of performance portability, we think um, sort of writing code once and then running it everywhere. And so is performance portability across heterogeneous devices really possible? And the answer is it, it depends on how you look at it. So the heterogeneous landscape has a, a, a wide range of different devices now. There's, there's accelerators, CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, APUs, FPGAs, and there's many others. And so to, to look at some of these a little closer, so a, a typical CPU architecture, you have, a, so you have a, small, a small number of cores that are running separate instructions on each, each core independently. 
and it's, it's low bandwidth memory, ran random access, and then you have, it's, this is generally suggested for task parallelism. And then if you look at a, a typical GPU architecture, this is a, so you have a large number of, of, of execution units with a single instruction running on a, a number of execution units, and this is, this is generally in lockstep. GPUs have a more hierarchical memory structure, so you have multiple different regions of memory with different affinity to the, the computation. And then you have the GPUs have a, a higher bandwidth, bandwidth memory and they have a more predictable memory. So, uh, and then and these and GPUs are generally suggested for data parallelism. If we look at FPGAs, a typical FPGA architecture, and F FPGAs are very different from from CPUs or GPUs. The the main the main difference is that whereas with a CPU or GPU you'd copy your code over to the device in order to to execute it, but FPGAs are, are reprogrammable at runtime. So the, the code that you execute is actually synthesized onto the, the hardware itself. And this is done through having these configurable logic blocks that are used for both memory and computation. And these are connected through configurable routings that provide different levels of bandwidth. And FPGAs are very low power consumption. And they have a, a sort of a, a stream execution model where rather than running a a function function once you have something that's run continuously with with data streaming in and out. Uh, as DSP as well, so D DSPs are are also very different from a, a CPU or a GPU. Uh, these are these are very sort of purpose built compute engines for performing things like add, subtract, divide, multiply very very quickly, and they're generally used for sort of digital and analog audio data stream processing. So to answer the the, the question. Is performance portability possible? The the short answer is is no. Architectures by by design are, are so different that there is no one solution fits all. In reality, you have uh, you have to find a, a balance between performance, portability, and productivity. Sort of performance being the the scalability and efficiency of your your application, portability being the the range of hardware that you, your application can target. And productivity being the the range of tasks your application can perform. So generally, if you have if you have performance and portability, if you are able to achieve sort of a, a good amount of performance portability, this usually comes at the cost of productivity. So so the the long answer to this question is performance portability possible. It, it, the answer is yes. The, the, with the right programming model, you can write you can represent your problem in a way which can adapt to different execution models and different memory models of different kind of uh, heterogeneous devices. So the next thing I'd like to look at is, is heterogeneous offloading. So how do you offload code to a heterogeneous device? So, so this, the best way to answer this question is to, to start with the, the C++ compilation model. So, so obviously you have your C++ source file, you have a, you pass it through your compiler and you have a, an object file. And you pass it through a linker and you have your executable. And then your executable runs on, on the CPU. But what happens if you want to also target a GPU or another heterogeneous device? How, how do you adapt this compilation model in order to support that? So there's, there's generally two, two approaches to this and one, one separate source and a single source. So separate source compilation, as, as an example, we're going to use OpenCL. So a separate source compilation, alongside your C++ source file, you have uh, a device source, so a, a separate source uh, that's, um, that's compiled separately. And this, is, this is then compiled by an online compiler that is linked to your, your executable. So the, the main thing to notice here, that this, this means that because this is, is compiled by an online compiler, it's compiled at runtime, which means that you, your device source has to be shipped with your executable. So to go, go, go back in and look at a single source, this, so we're going to use C++ AMP as an example. So the thing to notice here is rather than having the device code as a, a separate source file, it's all in, embedded inside the same C++ source file. And then alongside your CPU compiler, you compile your, the same source file with a device compiler. And this will generate alongside the CPU object some form of device intermediate representation or object file. This is then linked together with the CPU object and then you end up with a, an executable, executable with a, some embedded intermediate representation or object that will execute on your device. So some of the, some of the, the main benefits of the, the single source 
model over the separate source is that the, the host CPU code and the device code are in the same, same C++, C++ source file. And this allows compile time evaluation of your device code, which gives you type safety across host, CPU, and device. And it supports generic programming and also removes the need to distribute your source code. So the next, next thing I want to look at is, is how to describe parallelism. So there's many different forms of parallelism. And there's, there's different ways of, of describing it in your, in your source code. So these are the, the, the three things that we'll look at. So the first is directive versus explicit parallelism. So on, on the left here, we have an example of directive parallelism with OpenMP. On the right, we have an example of explicit parallelism with C++ AMP. So the way di directive parallelism works is you have some sequential C++ code, like some form of loop. And then you have a, an, a, a pragma that you attach to it that is a, a hint to the compiler. And the compiler then uses to uh, parallelize it either by sort of transforming the code to run multiple threads or transforming it to sort of SIMD operations. Whereas with the explicit parallelism, you have some form of a a API where you, you define a function and then a, a range of execution. And then that's, this function is executed on the hardware across for that number of, of executions. So next, we'll look at task parallelism versus data parallelism. So on the left, we have an example of task parallelism with TBB. On the right, we have an example of data parallelism with CUDA. So task parallelism is where you have multiple potentially different tasks that are running in, in parallel. And with the data parallelism, you have the same task being performed across a large data set in parallel. So next, next, there's a Q, Q execution versus stream execution. So on the left, we have an example of Q execution with CUDA. On the right, we have an example of stream execution with root GPU. So with Q execution, you have a function that's placed on a queue, and then that's executed, and then that returns. Whereas with stream execution, your function is executed in a continuous loop with data streaming in and out of it. So finally, the last thing I want to look at is data locality and movement. So one of the biggest limiting factors in heterogeneous computing is the, the cost of, of data movement in both time and power consumption. So it can, it can be, could take a considerable amount of time to, to move the data from a host CPU to a heterogeneous device that you want to execute on. This, this depends on the architecture. The, the bandwidth of a device can also impose bottlenecks, which can affect the throughput of your device as well. Additionally, it's, it's very important to make ensure that the performance gain you achieve from performing the computation on the heterogeneous device as opposed to the host CPU is, is larger than the cost of moving the data to the device. Otherwise, it's not, it's not worth the performing on the device. The other thing to consider is that many devices, such as GPUs, have a hierarchy of different memory regions. And each of these regions has a different memory size, affinity, and, and access latency. So for example, global data is generally DDR and has a sort of a very large amount of data but has a, a, a sort of a low affinity, so a very high access latency, whereas private memories generally sort of registers or on, on, on chip static RAM, where you have um, sort of a much smaller size, but has a much higher affinity to the computation, so a much lower la access latency. So no one having your data as close to the computation as possible can, can largely reduce the, the cost of the data movement. So look, looking at the cost of data movement in, in terms of power consumption, so this is a, a slide taken from a, a talk by Bill Daly in 2010 from NVIDIA. And this is, this is the measuring the cost of performing computations, uh, arithmetic computations, and moving data on an NVIDIA GPU. So the thing to notice here is that in the top left corner, you have a 64-bit double precision operation. That's costing 20 picojoules. And then just below that, there's the, the blue dot is a, uh, a read of four 64-bit um, operands for that operation. And that costs 50 picojoules. Then, so if, if you were to move these four 64-bit operands one millimeter across the chip, that would cost you 26 picojoules. Or if you were to move it across the entire chip, that would cost you a nanojoule. And then if you were to move it off onto DRAM, that's 16 nanojoules. So the, the, the cost in, in um, and power consumption from moving the data can, can, can have a dramatic impact on the performance of, the, of, your, of executing on the device. So 
the next thing is sort of how do you how do you move data from the whole CPU to a device? So there's there's a couple of different ways of doing it. There's explicit data movement and implicit data movement. So on the left is an example of implicit data movement with C++ AMP. And on the right is an example of explicit data movement with CUDA. So implicit data movement works by having data structures that are across host CPU and device that can be used. So on this, this, is, this is, has to be used with a single source programming model. So you have a single structure that you use on both the host and the device code. And then this, is, this implicitly handles the data movement for you. Whereas with explicit data movement, you have these explicit API calls that you have to explicitly pass pointers and say, I want to move this data over to the device. So the other thing is, how, how, do, you, how do you address memory across the whole CPU and the device? And there's a few different ways of doing this. So in comparison, there's the, first of all, there's, there's a multi-address space model where pointers have attributes or structures which specify where what sort of memory region that data should be stored. This allows finer control over where your memory is allocated or, or moved to, but it does mean you have to define it explicitly. And there's non-coherent single address space. This, this works by you have pointers that address the, a shared address space across the host CPU and the device. And they do this by having map operations uh, APIs which allow you to, so say you're accessing a pointer on the host, you would then have a uh, an API which says I want to map this data across to the device and then you could use the same pointer to access the same address in on the device and whereas with cache coherent single address space this is similar to the, the non-coherent single address space the difference is this is the, the you when you address a pointer on the host and device you're generally either addressing the same physical memory in hardware or you're accessing a, a cache coherent runtime which does, performs a synchronization at the cache level so this allows you to access the host CPU and the, uh, the same pointers on the host CPU and the device uh, concurrently. However, you are giving up a lot of control over when the data is moved. So, so this can be inefficient in some cases. Okay. So next, I'm going to look at talk about Sickle. So this is a, a new new standard that for heterogeneous computing in C++. So first of all, op OpenCL is a, a standard from the Kronos group that gives, provides a, a C API and a C language that allows you to offload code to many different heterogeneous devices. And Sickle is a, a relatively new standard that aims to provide a, <coughs> sorry, provide a, a single source C++ programming model that allows you to write standard C++ and target this range of this large range of heterogeneous devices through OpenCL. So the, the way the ecosystem for Sickle works is, so you have your C++ application, and you have some template libraries, and then some of these template libraries may implement an algorithm using Sickle. This is then compiled and executed <coughs> via OpenCL on a, a wide range of devices. So. First of all, how, do, how does Sickle improve the heterogeneous offload and portability, performance portability? So the first thing is Sickle is entirely standard C++. Sickle also allows you to compile to Spear, and Sickle supports a, a multi-compilation single source model. So in order to explain the, the multi-compilation the, the, the multi single source model, I'll first explain the, the single compilation model. So the way this works is you, you wrap around your, so this is the same single source model from, from earlier. So the way single compilation works is you, you wrap around the, the CPU compiler and the device compiler. So you have a single single source host and device compiler. And this is quite quite simple. You have a single compiler that you, you pass your, you compile your source file and you end up with an executable that you can run on the CPU and a, a GPU. The problem with it is that this is tied to a, a particular compiler chain. So say for example, you wanted to have an application that supported a AMD GPU, NVIDIA GPU, and SIMD CPU execution. So in order to do that, you would have to write, first of all, you could, you could write some C++ AMP code and compile that with a C++ AMP compiler. You end up with an executable that can run on CPU and execute on an AMD GPU. And then you, you write some CUDA source, compile it with a CUDA compiler, and you end up with an executable that can run on the CPU and execute on an NVIDIA GPU. And same again, OpenMP source, you would compile it with an OpenMP compiler, and you have an executable that can run on the CPU and run in SIMD operations. 
The problem with this is that you have three different compilers generating three different executables with three different sets of language extensions. And these are generally not interoperable with each other, which means that if you want to have a single application that can target all of these different hardware, it makes it very difficult to build this. Generally, it has to be the device you want to write execute on has to be decided at compile time. So some of the things that Sickle has tried to do to resolve this, the, the first thing is Sickle is entirely standard C++. So there's, there's no, no attributes, no additional syntax, no pragmas, and no keywords. It's just entirely standard C++ that can be compiled with any C++ compiler. The next thing is that Sickle can target through Spear. Spear is another standard from the Kronos group. It's under this a standard portable intermediate representation. So this allows allows Sickle to target compile to a, a single binary and target a large number of heterogeneous devices. So to look at the the multi the multi compilation model, and say so this works. So first of all, here you see the the device compiler is the Sickle compiler, and this generates Spear. Now. The way the multi-compilation model works is we separate the host compiler and the device compiler. The first thing this means is the host compiler can be any standard C++ compiler, so GCC, Clang, Visual C++, Intel C++, so it can fit in with any existing toolchain. The next thing is that you, you generate one a single executable with uh, embedded spear, and that can then execute across a wide range of heterogeneous devices. And this can be true, the device can be selected at runtime, because you have the standard intermediate representation, you, this adds a lot of performance portability. However, Sickle specification doesn't mandate that you have to use Spear. You can use any intermediate representation or binary format that's supported by an OpenCL implementation. So for example, if you wanted to support PTX, you could have, a, you have the same Sickle source code, you pass it through potentially the same compiler or another comp Sickle compiler, and then generate PTX, and that can be linked into the same executable, and then you can select that at runtime. So, so the next thing is, how, how does Sickle support different ways of representing parallelism? So Sickle is a, an explicit parallelism model, and it has Q execution model. And later versions of Sickle may, may try to do a different, d additional forms of, of, of parallelism. Uh, Sickle also supports both task and data parallelism. So these are two of the the APIs in, in Sickle. The first one is, is single task. This performs a, a, you pass a lambda or a functor object here and this is executed once. And then you have another one called parallel for, which um, you pass a functor or a lambda object again, but this is, you also pass a range. And this range specifies the, the, the work, work range that you want to execute across. The next thing is how, how does Sickle make data movement more efficient? So first of all, Sickle separates the storage and access of data, and it allows, Sickle allows you to specify where you want your data to go on the device. And Sickle allows, also allows you to create automatic data dependency graphs. So the first thing is how Sickle separates the storage and access of data through this relationship between buffers and accessors. So a buffer is an object which maintains data across the host, CPU, and one or more heterogeneous devices. You then have an accessor, which is used to describe the access on a particular device. So here we have an accessor to a CPU. Then you can create another accessor to a GPU. And buffers and accessors are both templated. They're, they're type safe across host, and this is what allows the type safety across host and device. So one of the things that accessors allow you to do is accessors allow you to specify what, where you want the data to be stored or allocated. So say you have a, a kernel function you want to execute, and you have a, a buffer, you can create a global accessor. So this will store the memory in the global memory region. So say you have a constant accessor, this will store the, the memory in the read-only memory region. If you, have, you can have a local accessor, this would store memory in the group memory region. So you can have quite fine grained control over where your, your data is stored. The next thing is the accessors allow you to do is accessors allow you to specify how you want to access the data, so whether you want it to be read-write or read-write or, or, or anything else. And then that using this, this the, the runtime can create these data dependency graphs. So as an example of this, if say you have four buffers and three kernels, so the kernel A reads from buffer A and writes to buffer B, kernel B reads from buffer A, writes to buffer C, and then kernel C reads from buffer B and C, and reads, writes back to D. So the runtime is able to automatically determine that kernel A and kernel B can run in parallel, because there's no dependencies there, 
but kernel C has a dependency on both A and B completing, so then it has to wait for them to finish before it can execute. So some of the benefits of this, this, these data dependency graphs is you, you it allows you to specify your problems in terms of relationships, so you don't need to perform any explicit data copies. Also removes the need for complex event handling between um, com uh, executions because it's automatically constructed via the accessors. Finally, it allows the runtime to perform data movement optimization, so it can preemptively copy data to a device where you're going to need it. It can avoid unnecessarily copying the data back to the host if you need to use it again on that same device later. And it can avoid copies to and from the device if, you don't, if you're not interested in the original values of the, the data. So to finish off, what, what, do, what does Sickle look like? So I'm going to go through a, a simple example of, of, of a Sickle application. So we're going to uh, try to implement a, a parallel add function that takes two input vectors and an output vector. So the first thing we need to do is include the header file. So this includes the, the entire runtime API. So the first thing, first thing we have to do in the function is create bu the buffers. So buffers handle, um, maintain a pointer across a host and multiple devices. It also performs synchronization. So using RAII, when buffers are destroyed, it synchronizes the data back to the host. So the, the buffer's lifetime is this function. So when the buffers are destroyed at the end of this function, it will synchronize the data back to the vectors that you passed in. So the, the next thing you do is create a queue. So you need a queue for, for executing work. And from the queue, you can create what's called a, a command group. So a command group defines the device code you want to execute, as well as the data dependencies that you need for that, that, uh, that function. So the first, the first thing you do inside the command group is you create these accessors. So we create three accessors for the three buffers. The two two input, input buffers have, have read access, and the output buffer has, has write access. Then you use the parallel for, that we saw earlier, in order to create a device function. So this takes two, two parameters. So there's first the range to describe the, the range of execution you want to do. So here we take the size of the access, the vector in order to determine the number of work items you want to execute. And the second parameter is, is a lambda function describing the, the, the device code. So the, the lamb, this lambda is the, the code that's compiled by the Sickle device compiler in order to execute on it's what's executed on the, on the device. So this takes a parameter as well. It takes an ID. So for each execution of this function on the device, the ID represents that space in the, in the, the range of execution. So the, the thing to notice here is that the parallel for takes a template parameter. And the reason for this is that because Sickle has this, uh, supports any standard C++ host compiler and any device compiler and inter interoperation between them, the, there's no standard way in C++ to name lambdas. So every, every C++ compiler has a different way of naming lambdas. So we need a way for the host compiler and the device compilers to be able to communicate regarding the the device function. So we, we add this template parameter in order to name the device function. So this, this kernel T here gives names this, um, this function. So finally, we add the, the body of the, the function. So we use the subject operator of the accessors to read from the input pointers, add them together, and assign it to the output pointer. And that's it. And finally, you, you, you initialize your, your vectors, and then you call the parallel add. And because the buffer synchronizes the data when this function returns, you have your result and output. And that's done. So, how are we looking for time? Do I have a minute? Yeah. So, so now I'm going to pass over to Michael to talk about the future of C++. There you go. Okay. Thanks, everybody. That was great. I mean. When I saw, I, I've been involved in OpenMP accelerator design as well as a lot of things. When I first saw Sickle, I was really impressed with how it does everything at a very high abstract level, very much like what C++ needs. Um, that ultimately, I think, is the big benefit of Sickle. You notice that it has, it implicitly allows you to do data movement as opposed to explicit. We're not saying explicit is, is, is bad. In some cases, you do need it. But in other case, in this for C++, it's a lot better model in, 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 in that way. So one of the things I want to talk about is about where C++ is going. Um, so what does, what does the future of programming C++ look like, given the fact that we have all these possible models to learn from, and it's time to add that to C++. 
Um, so a couple of things is that, of course, this is still being talked about um, in the committee, and we, th we anticipate that it will be three or four years before we can get to a, te a technical specification. The thing that will make that happen are these things. We're actually already almost 60, 80 percent of the way there. But believe, but all of this, so, we, we, so just to recap where we are, with C++ 17, we got the parallel algorithms and some progress guarantees, the basic guarantees and the parallel forward progress guarantees. The blue stuff is what's now in the queue to go into C++ 20. You got things from parallelism called database parallelism, task-based parallelism, execution agents. On the right-hand side, the concurrency stuff, we've already got the future plus plus with the when, the wait, when all, executors, people out there talking about coroutines. Co um, I, I lead the group on transactional memory, um, synchronics, atomic views, things like that, latches and barriers. Um, None of this is for GPUs. You know that, right? All of this stuff is only for CPUs. Okay. So how do we get from there to the to, to to GPU computing? Indeed, we have a mountain to climb, but it's actually not as bad as as, as it seems. Okay. So what we can do is that um, if we add the the futures and continuation model gives us an interesting starting point by extending, extending C++ 11 futures with this Microsoft style dot den continuations, which adds these sequential and parallel composition capabilities when you have when all, when all, uh, when all the futures comes back, that creates a join, or when any futures comes back, then you can do something with it. That's called a choice, okay? So these are compositions. We also have these additional utilities, which I don't really want to talk about, because they don't really add any semantics. Anthony Williams is talking about them right now downstairs, and he can do a great job on this stuff. So heterogeneous computing for SQL has a couple of choices that are already built up, okay? I don't want to use CUDA. CUDA is a great example, because they've done a lot of the pioneering work. And in fact, everything looks kind of like CUDA. But there's one problem with CUDA. What is that? It's C. It looks like C. It looks like functions, procedures, line by line. It is no, looks nothing like C++. We don't want that. We want something that is C++-like, that's template-like, that enables you to do static and, 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 and dynamic polymorphism, that can make it work with templates, with concepts, and all the other nice stuff that's coming. So the, of, the, of the groups that we, we, we have, SQL is actually a really, really good example at a very high level of allowing implicit data movement on the one hand, okay, um, as well as automatic data scoping. Um, it's ideal for things like heterogeneous computing in for deep learning, neural networks, machine vision, self-driving cars, okay. But we also can't ignore the distributed computing aspect that's offered by LSU's, Hartmut's talk, on using HPX. They do a terrific job as well, too, um, of doing this in a very, very C++, plus, in a very C++ plus, plus way. But they, they, do, they use an explicit memory movement dir directives. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. In some cases, you do need those things. So what else do we need? We also need what NVIDIA has. NVIDIA had these ways of creating these things called bulk dispatch. Once you get to the CPU, by the way, NVIDIA doesn't care how you get to the GPU, because why should they? Okay, they just think, they just know that once you get to the GPU, they know how to blast everything in a bulk dispatch, fire off a million threads, and make it all run in high throughput manner. How you get the data that, you know what, remember what Gordon was talking about, the data movement, how you get the data there, oh, that's your problem. Thank you very much. Just get it there, and we're going to make it run really fast. We need that. The other thing, of course, is I, I repeated HPX because I love it so much, but uh, that was an accident. But the heterogeneous computing compiler from HSA, why do we care about that? The AMD guys do, initiated the designs for, for uh, what they call APU, integrating the CPU and the GPU onto a single chip. What that gives you, what that offers you is tremendous low latency. One of the biggest problems you'll remember is this data movement, you know, the, the, the chart that, that, that Gordon was talking about. APU solves that problem in a unique way, using user queues, okay? And we need to learn from that. If you, if, you know, I chaired this SG14 study group, and in order for C++ to work at different architectures, whether it's a discrete CP GPU or an integrated uh, GPU, we need to be able to learn from that. And that's why I'm taking a look at those four models, okay? 
ultimately, what's going to come out is that we're going to be able to hopefully support massive parallelism on multiple distributed nodes with CPU or GPUs. Um, and there's been head starts in games and graphics. I won't go over to this too much because this is essentially about where the, where, how it all came or, or it can't come from. But what I do want to talk about is how we're going to get there. In order to get to GPU computing, we need executors. Executors are these unique creatures, are essentially to function execution, what allocators are to memory allocation. They're also what iterators are to STL. They marry, iterators marry between containers and algorithms. Executors marry between the constructs of parallelism, like for loops, parallel regions, with the resources that you're going to use to execute that. Maybe they might be a GPU node here, an open MP cluster, okay, a bunch of threads, a thread pool. If you don't have executors, you're going to have what's called an end-to-end -end relationship, where you're going to have, you know, every for each will have to have something that says this for each is used, is used to access a thread pool. Then you have another for each for open MP runtime. Then you have async for fibers. You don't really want a world where you have that end-to-end -end between the control structures and the diverse execution resource. If it can all go through an executor, the executor can effectively select the execution resource based on you, your, your, your policy parameters. You can now select where to run this stuff, when to run it, and how to run it. Okay? The how is already supplied essentially by the control, control architectures. C++ now already have quite a few hows. We can do async, we can do package tasks, we can do basic threads, we can do futures, we can do a couple of other things, okay? But right now, C++ has none of the concepts at the bottom. We don't have thread pools, we don't have ideas about CP, GPU, we only know about CPUs. All right. So, there are several computing, uh, uh, competing proposals, and they've been running around each other for the last three years. We last, this last summer, we started talking to them and making sure that we've been having, uh, you know, almost bi-weekly telecon calls, and we're making really good progress. And right now, this is what it's coming down to looking like. It's going to look like a minimal proposal that supports this kind of chart hierarchy, where it's a foundation for later proposals for heterogeneous computing. This is an early glimpse of some of the work we're doing. We're going to submit a, a paper for Issaquah for this. So I don't want to go too deeply, but you'll notice that in this diagram, you essentially have an executor, which has one or more of execution functions, that would create lightweight execution agents, which then executes execution, these instruction streams. On the other hand, at the very top, you have these contacts, which runs these execution agents, and these contacts would manage these execution resources, aka like a thread pool, and, the, and they would um, have, execute them on instances of execution platforms. I just said all that, sorry. <laughs> Um, just a quick recaps. I'm a, I got about 10 minutes left now. But essentially, there is also SIMD parallelism that's required. One of the key markers of GPU computing is that it's, it's almost all, a lot of it is SIMD in nature. You can't do it without it. So that was the other component that was missing. Okay? Without it, we're not going to go anywhere. We don't have a standard for SIMD computing. There's Boost SIMD. Every vendor has invented um, some sort of SIMD capabilities, but everybody programs it using built-in languages, built-in uh, function calls that's supplied by the vendor. It's terrible. Every, you, know, you, you, you switch from SSC to, to AVX or to IBM's, I don't know what they are, even though I used to work for them. Um, they, you, know, uh, you would have to rewrite your, all, all your code. We love doing this sort of stuff. Um, so, there's been two proposals. Against here, there's a competition. There's been two proposals put out. One is based on Boost SIMD. Joel Valku, I think, is going to talk about or has already talked about. It's by somebody named Matthias Gonard. Okay? And then a competing proposal came out based on the VC library, also by someone whose name is very similar to Matthias. <laughs> In this case, Matthias Kretz. Okay? <laughs> so it gets very confusing to say whose proposal this is. It's, it's Matthias's proposal. OK. <laughs> and what it is is now we're settling to the point that it's going to look like something like this. It's going to be a data paw that has a, that holds um, elements, n elements of type T that's written particularly for SIMD reg register. Okay. Now this morning a gentleman asked me, what if I have a different ABI? Well, there's an ABI, there's a defaulted ABI here assumed, but you can, there's an ABI parameter that you can add in if you have a different ABI. And this is really important because 
you know, th th this is a fundamental thing with SIMD. I'm not going to go too deeply into this. There are built-in operators. There's no promotions. But some of this stuff you can get from the slides. I do want to get to the final thing. This is that with this, we're going to be able to have the ability to, with the minimal proposals for executors, we're going to be able to get to a space with SIMD to a point where we can eventually um, um, get to this, this, this space. Now, we do have to do other things. We have to do the things that Gordon talked about. How do, what do we do about the address space? Uh, C++ assumes a single address space, single flat address space. We have to either do move to some sort of either multiple address space that's either cache coherent or cache non-coherent. We have to make decisions as to whether we should um, support either implicit data movement or explicit data movement. I kind of think we need both. We have to get to a few other uh, um, stage about should we support legacy GPU devices, discrete or, 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 or just integrated. We probably need, need almost all of them to some extent because we don't know whether we're doing it on an FPGA okay, or just a pure accelerator. So there are a couple of things. But ultimately, I want to take, the thing I want to take you, you guys want to take away from this is that G, heterogeneous computing has been coming for a long time. And that Sickle right now today, and a few other c candidates like HPX, like HC3, is able to supply heterogeneous computing on C++, okay? But depending on the, on the, on the, diff, the type of devices, um, they might, the, the level of support might vary. And finally, that we're also trying to add this to the C++ standard. Okay, and that's pretty much closes the talk. And I think the only thing that I want to mention, of course, is that now we just last week uh, the company has been working. The CodePlay company has been working really hard at releasing Compute CPP as a community edition, which is now free for download. And you can just go to this address. It essentially is an open source Sickle project that has the Compute CPP SDK, which is a collection of sample code and integration tools. It also is the one of the only one of the few implementations of parallel STL. The thing that's already in C++ 17, okay, and it's a Sickle-based implementation. And the difference is that it actually works on this GPU. These 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 parallel SCL routine runs on the runs on the GPU, not just on the CPU. It can also run on the CPU as well too. Most implementation would only run on the CPU because that's all the standard actually mandates. It has something called Vision CPP for for vision processing for self-driving car. This is unbelievably useful. Okay, it's the basis of why things crash and why they don't crash. Okay, and because we're using C++ algorithms to process images at a high enough speed such that they can be responsive enough for safety critical demands. You know, if your brake fails, you have to have that light show up on your dashboard within less than five nano uh, milliseconds. Okay, otherwise you're not you're not safe. The other thing, of course, is the Eigen C++ library, something that, is, that allows, so this is, all this is demonstrating what you can do with Sickle. You can build on top of Sickle such that you can um, execute it for deep learning neural networks. Why is this important? If you haven't heard about what's going on in the, in the, in the world now, almost everything you're using right now uses some sort of deep learning. When you do a Google translation, it's doing some sort of deep learning, going back to the central server and re to responding to you. When you're doing image recognition, that is all C++ deep learning using something called TensorFlow. And you can now potentially do, and in my future talks, I'm gonna talk a lot more about what these things can do. And that's the potential that we can get to in this future world that we're envisioning right now. So hopefully you guys can join us and download some of this, some, some of this stuff. Um, our team is ready to support um, the sickle, but in the meantime, my job isn't necessarily to toot my company's horn, but is to try to bring this stuff to the standard. Um, not necessarily sickle, but it'll be something that combines with sickle and other things like what we know about from HPX, what we know about from NVIDIA, what we know about from, um, from HCC. I know Google already also has a CUDA implementation. We're trying to take all that learning and add that to the C++ standard. So the ultimate result is something that works really well for, for C++. Thank you very much. Questions? I don't know if I have any other slides. Ah, this is the conclusion. I must well leave that up here. Okay. Discussions, questions? Oh, the one thing I do, I, I'll take one question, but there, if you're doing FPGA with Sickle, there is an, uh, an open source one called Tricycle that is done by Xilinx that is doing it. Go ahead, please. Uh, have you actually used Google in the last couple of years? Yes, I have. Yes. 
Yes, I know. I totally understand what you're saying. Um, the, the, the question is, could it in the last couple of years have improved significantly for C++? And they have. They have implemented most of C++. Um, so I would be saying that C, it, its root has always been C. Okay? Uh, of that, I'm, I, I don't think people would disagree. In the last couple of years, they've done tremendous progress towards C++. In particular, we admire how they've been able to do um, passing functions um, um, from the host to the to the device, but they are essentially the entire um, um, compilation uh, compilation unit. So yes, there's still so that's why I wanted to mention CUDA, and I know Google's effort on CUDA, CUDA that we're still also learning from them as well too. So no, we're definitely not ignoring CUDA. The the, the one thing though CUDA is driving toward is more of a um, unified unified virtual memory, okay, and that's the latest thing. So. And um, that's the latest thing that they're, 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 they are trying to do. So that's one model we're also adapt, adapting as well, too, using that, that, that unified virtual memory system. Yeah. They do have good stuff. They led the industry for quite some time, and they probably will continue. Yeah, go ahead. So, would you be able to repeat that again, sir? That's it. So, the question is Does Sickle offer a, a notion of time control? Like real time? I assume this is for real time. Yes. Uh, sorry, in, in the current Sickle's specification, there's, 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 no, um, there's no FBF for sort of measuring time on, on devices. So, Sickle is based on the, the future support of, of OpenCL. So, Sickle can only provide. provide Sort of hardware support for what OpenCL devices can support. Is there a way to implement like the functions in Sickle? Like, for instance, if I would <coughs> if I want to write functions for particular computer design, and particular situation, I'm not sure if it's seriously even possible to provide that sort of thing to that Sickle tool. So, the, so the question is, can you? Provide sort of device specializations of of certain functions. Yeah, so that that, that, is, that is possible in Sickle. Yeah, there's there's um so there's macros that you can use to say I, I want this this code to be defined only for the GPU, uh, only for the the device. Right, so you, so you can specialize host host side or device side code. Uh, question here. So, so, the, so the question is, if you, if you don't specify the device, um, does it cho to choose a, an automatic device? So, there's, so the, the example I showed has uh, just showed the, the queue. And so the queue just uh, does a sort of default selection, picks a device for you. But there is a sort of a, a range of different options you can do, and you can configure it to pick a very specific device. We have a device selector object, which is basically like a, a functor object where you provide a heuristic that allows you to say sort of, find me, pick a, a device that's a GPU from this vendor or supports this number of execution units. So you can, you can be quite specific about it. The, the other thing that the Sickle provides is um, you don't actually need uh, an open cell device in order to, to execute. So every, every Sickle implementation requires a, what we call a host device. So everything that can be run on a device in Sickle can also be run on the host with the same execution and memory expectations. So you can do debug on any standard C++ compiler. So, so the question is, so how do you how do you sort of program differently for FPGAs in terms of in terms of bits? So at, at the moment, the, the so the open cell standard is is still is still working towards supporting um, FPGAs, and there's there's a lot of F FPGA vendors in open cell. So there's there's a lot of active work in the standard just now for trying to provide sort of a better standardization to cover the different sort of um, memory model and execution model of, of FPGAs. So there's there's still some work to be done there, and, and Sickle will continue to support um, all the versions of OpenCL. So at the moment, Sickle 1.2 supports OpenCL 1.2 hardware, but later, later oh, Sickle will continue to support later versions of OpenCL. So all, all advances in in OpenCL uh, hardware and software capability will be represented in, in Sickle as well.
So, so, so the question was, so the the example that I showed at, at the end. So, so that that that, that was that was so that example you could you could do yourself if you if you if you downloaded Compute CPP. So that that that, that would work work now with the, the current version of Compute CPP. So at the moment, Compute CPP. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the question is: there any particular? So what what target? What platforms do we support? At uh, the moment, Compute CPP. The Community Edition supports uh, Ubuntu 14.04 and CentOS operating systems, and we support Intel CPU and AMD GPU. So we've tested with a certain number of different uh, OpenCL drivers. But the if when you download when you download the uh, Compute CPP, the integration guide and uh, will will give you sort of specifics of what drivers are supported. I think that's the final question. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.